On your journey through life, you are the hero. There are times, however, when it is beneficial to have an advisor to guide you along your path. Welcome to the Smart Money Simplified Podcast with Brent Mikosh, Certified Financial Planner, Certified Investment Management Analyst, and Co-Founder of MP Advisors, LLC. In this podcast, Brent discusses some of the most important and interesting topics of the day as they relate to finance, the economy, and beyond. Now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome to Smart Money Simplified with Brent Mikosh. Brent, what's going on, my friend? What's going on? Well, it's May the 4th, and, and prior to hopping on uh, this conversation, we are talking about Cinco de Mayo. So uh, getting I don't have a big celebration plan, but the, the, you and then Andrew Beersley, who's with me, do have celebrations plans. So I feel a little bit kind of left out of this thing. What do you, what do you got going on for Cinco de Mayo? You were invited, man. You know, it's just, I'm not, it's a I'm longer not in commute. Nebraska, though. You know? I know, right? There's really only one reason to come here, and that would be for for, for your Cinco party. de Mayo celebration. Yeah, we're we're gonna have a big celebration at the house, and and uh, yeah, quite a few people. My wife's been cooking for four days, and you know, having 150 people over at the house for some authentic uh, Mexican cuisine is gonna be fantastic. And we have not told any of our guests which which dishes contain the lengua, which is cow tongue. So, okay, it'll okay. be a surprise. It'll be it will be a surprise. Nice they will surprise. have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? You, well, uh, you, know, Andrew, got, you said Andrew, right? Andrew's got something. Yeah. Going Andrew, on. Andrew, tell us what yeah, you got going so, on. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm a part of a group here in, in Scottsdale called the Scottsdale Charles. And we, we put on events and raise money for kids' charities and um, for education at Scottsdale schools. And we're putting on a, our third annual Charo Invitational Golf Tournament at Greyhawk Golf Course. And so, it's going to be a little Cinco de Mayo themed. We'll have margaritas and I don't know if it's going to be as authentic Mexican food as you have, but uh, <laughs> it'll be pretty close. About 200, 200 players out there all day and raising money and it's going to be, it's going to be a good long day. Hey, you That'd had me at children's fun, charities, yeah. man. You had me at yep. children's charities. That's great. And we're, we're going to luck out with some low eighties weather. So Perfect. we're not, uh, it's not going to feel like summer quite just yet. But it'll be nice. Absolutely. All right, well, Brent, I'm excited. what are you guys talking about today? Well, you know, I'll tell you, um, I get a ton of a ton of questions from uh, clients and associates and people that we work with about what's happened in the real estate market. You know, when I first moved to Arizona in 2007, this this was an area that was really dominated by retail, real estate, and tourism, real estate probably being the most important of those things. I've always said that since 2007, I think the financial crisis was one of the great things and one of the great blessings actually to come to the state of Arizona because it really, really diversified this economy. All that noted, you know, the real estate values have been really incredible in the last three or four years here and a lot longer. Uh, interest rates are going up. There's a lot happening uh, in the real estate market. So I've, I'm getting a lot of questions from clients. Should I be looking at another house now? Should I be selling my house? Um, what's what's happening in the overall market? Because real estate is still a very, it's not as big as it was, but still pretty, pretty big deal in here in the state of Arizona. So I've got Andrew Beersley here with me. He works with Silverleaf Realty, one of the best uh, real, realty firms that we have here in Arizona. And uh, we're going to talk about sort of everything Arizona real estate and perhaps beyond today. So Andrew, thanks for coming, coming in and speaking to me. Why don't you just give us a, a quick background first about yourself and what sure. got you into this field? Yeah, I appreciate you having me. Uh, so I actually started in commercial finance uh, right out of college and so worked here in town with a company called Johnson Capital so we did a lot of the financing for big apartment complexes retail centers and things like that and then October of 08 happened and life changed for for many people and uh you know I held on for a little bit there and the outlook was was a little a little drum and so I made the move into residential in 2010 and went over to Silverleaf Realty. There was um, some history there. My my parents had both been in real estate for for quite a while, and the original developer who developed DC Ranch and Silverleaf, big golf course community in North Scottsdale, hired my parents in the early 2000s. And my dad was running the office. My mom was one of the original agents, and so they had been there from the inception. And so that was always something that was close to me and comfortable with me. And I never thought I was going to be in residential real estate. Um, and it was, it was an ask to, Hey, do you want to come do this with me from my, from my mom? And it was one of those where I'm like, do I really want to go work with my mom, uh, in, in real estate? And I ended up taking, taking the leap and you know, it's, it's, it was an interesting time. 
Um, the markets, as you mentioned, it was kind of right after you moved here. Uh, we're we're starting to feel like we're coming back to normalcy uh, around that time frame. But this was a this was a unique area, much higher end uh, real estate, and you know we weren't dealing with a lot of distressed properties up there. It was people that were at the time, you know, had pushed through, you know, the banks had pushed through a lot of the distressed inventory, people coming from around the country for all the reasons they come to, to Arizona, to the Valley, you know, the lifestyle, the weather, but this, this community in general was really starting to, to see an upswing. And so we were doing a lot of, a lot of land deals, a lot of new construction, uh, builders were building spec homes. And so there was a lot of activity. Uh, it was a quick learning experience for me. And really from that point on, um, you know, we have, we've really grown the business. That community has become, you know, nationally known and, you know, I've got high profile people that live in, live in the community, professional golfers, things like that. And so as my career took off and as this market really saw its upswing over the past 13, 14 years, that really set our group on a trajectory and we were able to take advantage of really a growing real estate market for a decade plus, which, which has been pretty amazing to witness. And then it all just got completely blown in, you know, to the stratosphere by, by COVID and, and everything that happened with that. Yeah. COVID was really fascinating. And, and I don't mean that in a, in a great no, way, cause it no. was challenging for, for a lot of people and a lot of businesses. But what I saw even in terms of my own client book is we've got, you know, we've got clients in 26 states. We saw we saw in a, a microcosm of this massive migration that happened. Not two, two, two families, wonderful families from California both picked up and they went to Tennessee, for example, outside, right. outside of Nashville. And they weren't the only ones to do that. What was it like? Let's talk about that. Because when COVID hit, everybody that was running a business, immediately the alarm, the panic button oh, yeah. got hit because Absolutely. who knows when we're even going to be able to do business again. Um, at least in the capacity that we, that we realized that. So what was the point where you realized, because I think COVID is central to this discussion because it impacted real estate so greatly. What was the point where you realized like, wow, this, is, this isn't just something that's happened far away. It's hitting here. And then you made a decision in terms of how you had to pivot your group. Sure. It, was, it was interesting. My wife and I went to New York City, kind of a late anniversary trip. And it was the beginning of January, 2020. And nobody was really talking about it much. Um, when we when we got to the city, we started seeing people wearing masks more. And when we were flying back, you know, we started. It, it was it was something like, oh wow, look like, like look at that. People are people are wearing a lot more masks over here. Is this is this really something that's happening? And then when we went on our spring break trip in the beginning of March, we went on a ski trip. And it was truly the days where we're watching the news and the NBA shuts down and, mm -hmm. you know, you're watching the stock market drop and you're going, okay, this is, this is very, very real. And we were wondering if we were even going to be able to fly home. And we get home that Friday, the 12th, I remember because my son's birthday was the next day mm -hmm. and schools got shut down and, and really everything just stopped. And it was at that point where I remember my parents who were, you know, in their seventies were going, I don't think we can come over to your house for Austin, my son, Austin's birthday tomorrow night. Like that, that level of fear and concern and just unknown was there. And at that point I'm, I'm sitting here going, okay, what is this? What is the lasting effect of this? I mean, this is now hit home. This is very real. My parents don't want to literally drive 10 minutes down the street to be with their own kids. Like it's that kind of a fear. You know, we've got an office in Flagstaff, you know, up in Forest Highlands, which is a second home community. And the thought was, all right, if this if this tanks the market, what's the first thing that's going to go? Discretionary income. You know, people are going to have second homes. They're going to lose those or they're going to try to just sell those off. Or like, is that business going to survive? Then we're thinking here locally, you know, what what is the overall impact of this? Because we we lived through 06, 7, 8. We saw, you know, how things can go bad very quickly. And so there was that, there was that pause that everybody had when we were all staying home and really doing nothing. But fortunately here in Arizona, you know, things started to get back to normal a little quicker than everywhere else around the country. About May is when 
we were feeling like we were able to go out again and restaurants were opening up and the phone was starting to ring again. I was getting clients to call and go, you know, what, is there anything we can do? What should we be doing? And throughout that summer of 2020, there was still a lot of unknown with our clientele, even with us, you know, how do we advise our clients as to what they should be doing? The end of the summer of 2020 is when there was like, I remember it, it was, I, we were, we were in San Diego and my clients from Chicago, from California, from, and one from Seattle called and they had all been looking and it was like this immediate light went off and they're like, we get, we have to get to Arizona now. We want to move. We had a goal of being here in the, in the, you know, the next year or so we want to do it now. And while I was on vacation, I ended up putting three contracts together, sight unseen in about a three day period. And all three of those clients ended up closing on deals. And that was beginning of August, 2020. And from that point on, there was just this absolute monumental growth of the interest and the urgency and the energy for people around the country wanting to get into this market. Now, was that driven by the the fact that Arizona, we were very, very fortunate in the sense that, um, you know, lifestyle wise, I, I never stopped coming to the office, for example. And that, right. and that wasn't that unusual. Right. Whereas other parts of the country were in complete lockdown. We just never had that. So was that people fleeing to try to get to a much less restrictive state? Or was it uh, the fact that now, given the fact that so many people were working from home, now they had the option? Was was it was it a lifestyle thing, or was it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yes yeah. to both. I would yeah. I would tell you, I think the 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 main one was we want to get to somewhere where we feel like we have freedom, like right. where we can leave our house, where we have the ability to be outside. Parks are open. You know, schools are maybe relatively open. And then tack that on with, I don't have to be in Chicago running my wealth management firm. I can do it remotely. And so it was a combination of both, but I always look back on it and go, you can be one of the most successful people in your field, have all the money in the world. But when you're sitting there being told that you can't leave your house and you're shackled to one place and, you know, all the things you love about the community around you aren't there. The, you know, the restaurants aren't there. The social life's there not there. The lifestyle's gone. That's a very scary proposition to a lot of people. And when you see others doing something totally different, you question, okay, why am I here? Right. And I, I, I rib one of my clients to this day. He texted me, Hey, what are you doing? And he's in Chicago and he's, we've been, we had been looking for houses for a couple of years and I, I was playing golf. And so I sent a picture of me sitting in the cart kind of with my feet, like looking out at this beautiful Scottsdale <laughs> golf course. And he yeah. just texts back. He's like, why do you do that? Like, <laughs> I'm like, why are you not here? And exactly. it was, it was kind of one of those. And he was one of the ones who about a month later ended up buying a house sight unseen. And he's been here and he splits time between here and Chicago. And it was the best decision he ever made. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, experienced a little bit of the same. I had a friend of mine that was uh, I'd worked with. I lived in New York City for a long time before I moved out here, and I worked with him. He came out here and visited from New Jersey during that summer, and he said, "Well, you know, what what, what are we going to do?" I'm like, oh, "Let's go grab a beer." He's like, "We can actually go to the bar and have a beer." It's like, "Yeah, man, this yeah. is a free state, you right?" Know? And I think that's really important. I do hope you know that that we remember that because we will have another example where we're going to have the opportunity not to get political, but I will for a second where we're going to have the opportunity to free, to choose to relinquish a lot of our personal power and liberty or or we let people make their own decisions. And in Arizona, uh, I feel like we we threaded that needle very well. I think public safety was important for sure, but I also think that people were given the freedom to make the decisions that they felt were best for them, for them and their family. So you saw this onslaught of people now coming in. You said that started tail end of 2020. Yep. What did like what did this look like in terms of relative to normal volume and in sense it was it fifty percent more hundred percent more like what, what I was mean, it like we we experienced a ridiculous real estate market you know right before the great recession I mean this was one of the epicenters of watch what watch what values are doing you saw people buying two three homes you know, leveraging to the gills with, you know, nothing more than just the ability to sign your name on a piece of paper and you'd make 30, 40, 50% on your properties. 
the the fundamentals behind that were so broken. This was purely driven by, you know, a a generational shift in wealth to this market. Yeah. And it was it was interest, you know, it was the long term thought of, you know, how as you mentioned, how our market's changing, the different industries that we have that are coming here, the the growing tech sector, you've got, as you said, you look at certain states, certain cities that are really struggling accepting some of the political decisions that have been made. And whether it's being overly taxed, whether it's, you know, being told you can't go somewhere, you can't leave your house, whether it's crime, whether it's, you know, terrible weather, all of those things started just hitting home to everybody. And so from that point on at the end of 2020, really through, I want to say March or April of 2022, it blew out that, that previous market by tenfold. It, this was the craziest real estate market we've ever seen here. And values went up where we were seeing values go up 35, 40, 50% year over year for two, three years in a row. You know, the transaction volume was so phenomenal to try to comprehend. I mean, it was, I, I made a joke before where it's like, I, I do mostly listings. And so I made a joke. I'm like, as soon as you get a listing signed, you've gotten paid because you're going to sell that. The house is going to sell. Right. And and I'd have sellers come to me and go, what, I mean, what do we, what should we even list for? I'm like, what do you want to sell for? I mean, it was, it was truly almost like a wild west kind of experience. And it's, it's hard because people are going, well, now, you know, you saw values go to, you know, such high levels where are you, are you really creating the lack of affordability, you know, in this market? You go, well, it's it's hard to stop something. It's hard to stop this snowball that's rolling because there is such high demand that if somebody is willing to pay it and they're seeing an inherent value coming from another market, they're going to pay it. And so it was it was pretty fascinating to, to witness for sure. And how much of that too, you had kind of a perfect, I guess a good storm in terms of selling houses where you had you were in an area with with extreme demand. There's no question about it. It seems to me, not knowing not knowing the the dynamics internally, the real estate market, when you look at the overhang that you had in single family homes, there wasn't much. No, this is nothing like. And and clarify this, and tell me if I'm wrong here. But a question I do get from clients is saying, "Are we going to see another correction to the extent that we saw in, in 08, 09? And my answer in Arizona is, yeah, will, "Will prices stabilize, go down? I don't know, but what I can tell you is that inventories are historic lows Correct. still. Yes. So is that accurate here it's in this market? Still, right now, it's as low as it's ever been. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think that's that's important to note because you mentioned the, the difference between the cycle and in in the Great Recession. And now, when I moved here, I met people that had you know, very little income that owned five or six houses because they were buying these things almost like like they were they thought they were trading options or something. Sure. And when things went sideways and that when that when that liquidity or that or that, that demand rather dried up. They were now competing against the builders you yeah. know, who had yeah. massive tracks of, of houses that, that weren't sold yet. And they were competing with the other, you know, dozens and dozens of people that were doing the same thing. And you had obviously the state income loans. You could go into all the things that, that helped that help to make that possible. But again, looking at the data from the outside in, which way prices go? I don't know. But I know there's not a lot of supply. Yeah, it's, you know, no, nobody has a crystal ball to, yeah. to know what is really going to happen. I mean, there's... There are so many factors going on in our world globally right now that things could shift on a dime. But when you're focused here locally, we are at such a low inventory level. I think the last time I looked, Maricopa County had something around just under 13,000 total homes for sale in all of Maricopa County. I mean, that is ridiculously low. And so when you have the demand when you have so many people that are wanting to be here that are still wanting to be here it, it that demand has not changed the in migration into maricopa county is still number one in the entire country this past year there was this there was an article that i read about a month ago that tracked the shift of wealth over the past decade globally and so the metric was how many millionaires are moving into a market and so the number five, Scottsdale was number five in the world for wealth growth over the past 
10 years in the world in the world and so this is a this is a small market and so we're talking we're comparing to palm beach we're comparing to new york city we're comparing to dubai i mean think about all these big ticket cities you think about when you think about the richest you know places on earth you know scottsdale it's like the veil was lifted off of this place and i think having lived here for as long as i have since 1988 it, you think it's this sleepy resort western kind of town and covid removed that it's it's no longer a secret. And so there is something very unique going on right now still where people are realizing, okay, I can move my business here. I can move my family here if I'm ready to retire. If I was wanting to do this in five or 10 years, why am I waiting? Let's do it now. The, the great exodus out of California is still happening. It's even ramping up. And so, you know, you're seeing that population migrate west or migrate, excuse me, migrate east. And, and this, the valley is still trying to soak up all of those people. But the fact that we don't have anywhere to put them because our inventory levels are so low, that's what's continuing to keep prices up. You know, good houses are still selling for really good record numbers. But what we are seeing, there is a stabilization happening, which needs to happen. There are homes that were purchased over the last couple of years. People maybe, you know, bought on a whim and and moved back to wherever they came from. And and houses are coming on the market. They're having to compete with other homes. If they're not great sellable homes or if they're overpriced, we're seeing prices come down across the board. So there is a stabilization happening, which has needed to happen. Like there was no way we were going to be able to continue the trajectory from COVID and and keep sane. So it's it's interesting because there's a little give and take right now between buyers and sellers it's the 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 expectations between the two are quite different yeah i think you hit on a great point because that's that's something that i've been saying to people is is the buyers now have figured it out and you're, you're playing in a slightly different market where i'm sure you've got a lot of cash buyers for sure that are coming in but they're they have options with their cash now they're not getting paid zero on their cash they can be getting paid i mean our enhanced money market fund five percent right now right you know so you've, you've got options but for your average buyer out there, the difference between a six and a half, seven percent mortgage and a three percent mortgage is monumental. I mean, that's the difference. Absolutely. That's the difference between a three quarter of a million dollar house and maybe five hundred thousand dollar house, you know, depending yeah. on how much they want to put down. So are you and I've found that now even people that have the money, everybody's taking a little bit of a step back because they want to see how it plays out. So the buyers, the buyers are starting to get a little bit more, I guess, control, a little bit, be a little bit more charged. And sellers don't really realize that the landscape has changed a little bit. Sure. The, the urgency for the buyer to have to act to get the house yeah. has gone away because they know the house isn't going to sell in the first two days. I mean, there's, there's a few that might be, that might still be doing that, but it's not like it was. And so buyers are sitting watching the news, you know, hearing all the things that are going on and going, I'm waiting for the shoe to drop. I don't want to buy at the top of, you know, the tip of the dip, somebody said to me. And I, I was like, okay, that's interesting. But, you know, that's the psychology of where a buyer's at. They're trying to find the value. They're trying to find a deal. Sellers are sitting here going, I'm not distressed. I don't have to sell. Most people have done quite well over the past three, four years. So they're, they're comfortable. They're sitting on a lot of money. If it's a good house, I'm going, I just saw a house down the street sell for X. I don't know why I can't get that. You know, I'm patient. You know, it's gone back to a, a typical real estate market where it's going to take a while to get it sold. It's going to take a number of showings. You're going to have to know what you're doing. You're going to have to advise your clients well to do it. But Sellers are just sitting here going, I don't, I don't have to fire sale this. Like I'm patient. I'm going to get the number I'm going to get. And buyers are going, well, I want a deal. And so there's a disconnect there and it's just taking longer for that meeting of the minds to happen. Tack that on with a lot of our buyers are coming from out of state. And so they don't really know what they don't know. They don't know what Paradise Valley is really like. They don't know what North Scottsdale is like. They don't know about the East Valley or... So they're having to go through the process of seeing all of these places, understanding them so that the buying process is taking longer. So everything is just moving a little more slowly, which is fine. And it's, and that's okay. It's just, you know, when you don't have 
places to place all of these buyers, that's when it it can be a very, it can get frustrating at times because you know people want to be here, but you just, they can't find what they want. Now, is, this, is the influx still coming from, um, is California, would that be number one? Yeah. What what would be other markets that they're coming to Arizona? Uh, I mean, if you break it down, what we see, you know, most most have a presence in Arizona to begin with. They're moving up, down, sideways, whatever. California, by far and large, would be the biggest feeder market outside. The Midwest is a huge, a f- huge area. You know, Chicago, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, those places, uh, we see that as well. But then coming out of COVID, we saw, you know, a lot more of the Northwest coming out of Oregon, coming out of Washington. We're seeing people from New York. We're seeing people from Florida, a lot more people from Florida than I've ever seen. And that's the that's due to the shift of who's been moving to Florida. I talk to people all the time. They're like, the nice little beach town I was in, now it feels like I'm in Manhattan because yeah. everyone from New York has moved down and it's changed the culture and we want to get out. And so it's just, it's a very interesting dynamic watching kind of how the migration patterns have shifted where people want to be. Now for, for clients coming in that, that are not just looking to move for purely a lifestyle choice, sure. but are also looking, saying, hey, where's the best place for me to run my business? What uh, other states are, do you feel Arizona is competing with for that business? Probably Florida, Texas, Tennessee. I think where you're seeing, you see it in the news, you see where everybody seems to be going. They they tend to be the more conservative states. They tend to be the states with lower tax bases, you know, incentives for businesses. You look at what we're doing here. You look at the chip manufacturing plants that are going in and mm-hmm. how many jobs that's going to create. You look at, I I can think of off the top of my head, six or seven clients that I have that are moving their entire companies here just because of a combination of lifestyle, affordability, uh, obviously tax incentives, things like that. But, you know, this, this has such large economic ramifications moving forward. Like the Valley Phoenix in general, we have the land to expand. We have the land to grow. You know, we're, we're kind of a small, big city. Uh, And so it's, there's a lot of, positives for, you know, the next 10, 15, 20 years and beyond. And I think a lot of smart people are seeing that and wanting to get here sooner rather than later. I have a theory that I've been kind of thinking about a little bit over the last probably year or so. And I'm curious your thoughts on this. I feel that, um, you know, one thing that we've noticed across all of society is, you know, things are very bifurcated right now. Right. It's like there's, there's parts of the economy right now that are, that are in a depression. There's parts that are still booming. You've got an area specifically around real estate is that that um that question of phoenix versus not to pick on youngstown ohio for example but i will the competitive advantages that good states and and then good localities have relative to the disadvantages that certain parts of the country have are extreme and getting more extreme and so if you're someone that's looking at at buying real estate obviously you know either to move a business here or from a personal standpoint, or as an investment property, the what are you willing to pay? It's almost like a really well-run company uh, is what it can can trade at a multiple way beyond what something that's not run so great at. And it seems like it seems like that that difference is becoming more and more extreme. And the competitive advantages of certain you bring up Florida, you bring up Texas here in Arizona. It's not just it's not just getting a little better. It's getting a lot better. At the same time, when some of the what formerly would, have, would be competitors for us in sure. California, of course, comes to mind. New York, you know, I lived in New York City for ten years. The likelihood I would ever move back to New York City. I love the city. It's a shame what's happening there. It's zero. Right. I would never move back to New York City. Right. There's <laughs> tons of places I would go to in New York, but that that's becoming more extreme. So I think that, that for Arizona, I think it bodes really well for us in the future, provided we don't screw it up. Correct. And again, a lot of that goes to policies that were made over the past few years during COVID and you look at cities like New York, you look at cities like San Francisco. I mean, they're, they're ghost towns. And I saw something the other day, a a big investment group bought a office building in 2019 in downtown San Francisco for $300 million. And they just put it on the market for $50 million. Yeah. And 
there's 50,000 vacant apartment units in San Francisco. There's when you don't have those people living in the city and working, you don't have the vendors on the street. You don't have the restaurants that can survive. You don't have all of those ancillary jobs that come along with those people. And you just, you watch essentially, you watch these once thriving metropolises just start to crumble into the earth and you wonder how are they going to survive? Are they going to come back? And it goes back to the policies that are made to try to have a well-run city, have a well-run organization. And when you take money away from civic organizations like the police and the fire department and things like that, you end up seeing crime rates go up. You end up seeing homeless populations blow up. You know, it's, it's difficult because you have a lot of people that have spent their entire lives in these markets and have generations, generations of, you know, people in California or in Chicago or New York and places like that, that have just had enough. Yep. And I have these conversations every day. I had a conversation last week with a client who they held on as long as they could in Chicago. And like we're in the north north side of Chicago, we just can't do it anymore. We got to move. We got to get out. And it's like, we're doing it now. And never thought they would ever do that. But, you know, that people are reaching a breaking point and they're looking for these beacons of light for a better, you know, for lack of a better phrase of where, where can we go? Where are we going to feel safe? Where are we going to, where can my company thrive? Where are we going to meet, you know, like-minded people that we're going to feel comfortable, you know, moving on with the rest of our lives with. And this is one of those places, you know, this is, this is a, you know, this is a town where, you know, most people are coming from elsewhere, coming into the Valley. And so it's, it's got a more of a laid back sort of a vibe. People are coming here to retire. People are coming here for the weather to be outside. You know, it's, it's, very interesting and sad at the same time because you're watching some of these amazing places around this country just start to fold and you wonder what is it going to take to get them to come back i don't know i will pick on chicago in terms of you know i've been to the city i think i lived there for about six months when i was younger it's a, it's a marvelous place they just elected a insane asylum guy for a mayor yeah. i mean it's insane and that's a very unfortunate but i think to, the, to your point in terms of one of the benefits that Arizona has is um, recently we had some really good friends that moved up to Boise, Idaho. And uh, I had not been to Boise, went up there about five or six months ago to visit them. I liked it. Yeah. It was great. But relative to this valley, nothing going on. No. You know, and and I went up there thinking with kind of an eye like, wow, is this a place I could live? And the answer three days later when I got back on the airplane was it's really nice, but no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not a place I could live full time. Yeah. And my brother-in-law, he, he lives up there and yeah. we visited in the last two summers and, and that actually had the highest real estate value growth of any, of any city in the country at one point. And the massive growth in building and it's a, it's a nice, beautiful, sleepy kind of a college town. Yeah. That's a perfect example of where you saw the covid wave of urgency to buy and get us out of california and get us out of the northwest like this is where we're going to land this is beautiful can it sustain that and it can't because it's yet. now seen well it, it saw the in the greatest value drop I was you know, at one that. point yeah so so when you compare that to phoenix this is a market that can sustain that and so we have the we have the space we have the economy behind it we have the policies we have a lot more going on for it to be able to sustain those values moving forward. And I truly think that the shift that we saw, that jump that we saw from, okay, this house was $2 million in 2019, and now it's worth $4.5 million. Right. I think that shift, that was a jump that we're not coming back from, really. I think with the amount of wealth that's moved in and the demand that will most likely continue. I think we're going to just slowly move up and down normally off of that new level of, of value. We've got a lot of equity in homes. You know, we've got people sitting on two and a half percent interest rates for 30 years. I mean, 
they're comfortable. That's another reason we have low inventory. People are just going, why, why do I feel like I need to go anywhere? I'm very content where I'm at. People are making conservative decisions. So it's, it's continuing the trend. So, so we'll end our conversation on this. I'm going to give you two questions. I'm coming to you as a out of state buyer. What is something that I should be considering before I, before I look at making Arizona home or a, a significant real estate transaction in Arizona? What would be your advice to me? My first question would kind of be the family dynamic that you're bringing. Do you are you still completely enmeshed in your career? Do you have kids? Are you you know, at a retirement age, or are you moving a bit? I think I, I would need a little more background on on who the person is, but you know, it really goes to understanding who I'm talking to very quickly, and then being able to position the different areas of town that I know really well. and And I think somebody that can be really good at this job understands all the different pockets and markets of where we do live, and and because they're all very unique and and. And people can fit into these different neighborhoods extremely well. And so long-winded answer to your very direct question is I, I would probably try to diagnose you a little better before giving that kind of advice. And then from there, you know, it's it's very simple to direct people in a way where they feel confident that they're being advised correctly. Um, and then, you know, eventually letting them make the ultimate decision on what what's best for them and their family. Now, I guess conversely, let's say that I'm here in Arizona yep. and um, thinking about selling my house. I want to stay in the valley looking for maybe to move a little bit up market or, or something a little bit bigger. But to your point, I'm sitting on a sub 3% mortgage. I'll never see that money again. I've got a pile of equity built up in my house. I'm going to have to pay up now to get something that I want. And you're making that decision. Yeah. You know what? Do I do I hang out and wait a little bit or is this and, and wait for because you're in a bind there. <laughs> Cause, oh yeah. Because if you sell your house for this for for what's been a highly appreciated value, you're buying something else that's very highly appreciated. If you wait, then and you get a better deal on the buy side, but you sure. lost on the sell side. What's your advice to that seller? I, I've got well, I've got a lot of buyers that are kind of in that dynamic right now. If you don't have to sell, and if 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 you're really not truly needing to get out of your house or or you've got the other house where you want to get a bigger house because your family's growing and things like that. It's, it's tough because I've, I've been kind of telling people, let's be patient for a little bit. We're going into summer. We're going to start to see a little bit of a slowdown. Let's let some more houses come on the market. Let's let there be some competition. So you're not feeling like you are buying at that elevated level still. I mean, the, the fact that we're, we're seeing things start to settle a bit, that's only going to continue as time goes on with regard to, you know, sellers, if they, if they really need to get out of it and move it, let's move it. Let's make you the most money as you possibly can. Let's get you as confident as possible. And, you know, interest rates are, you know, they just got bumped up again over 5% for the first time since 08. 10, year, 10 years falling hard though. Yeah. And the fed, the fed's not, I don't think they're seeing what's happening on the long end of this yeah. bond market. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, if they have the ability, you might be buying the house at a value, call it a $1.5 million house for just basic math. Maybe that value's come down a hundred grand or 150 grand since the peak of COVID. Yes, interest rates have gone up, but you might be getting that value on the actual purchase price based off of the interest rates you're going to be paying. Yeah, your interest rate, your monthly payment's going to go up, but you know that's only in the short term, you know, I think if you look at a few years out, if you look at things stabilizing, if you look at it, you know, the next administration coming in, you know, there's always a chance to refinance. Yeah. You know? true. So if you need to make a life changing move, don't try to time it like you're timing the stock market. Like if that doesn't work, it doesn't get work in the market. The <laughs> let's get in the market. Like <laughs> yeah. let's sell your house. Let's do well. Let's find you the next place you want to be hopefully get you into that for, you know, a great number, a good value where you feel good about it. Let you take that life step, move on with your life and then readjust when the opportunity comes to, you know, get a better interest rate and and move on. But I, I try to avoid telling people not to do something because I know they want to. Right. And so just try to advise them in the best way possible. Awesome. Well, Andrew, this has been uh, very insightful and I appreciate you coming in. How to, tell me who, who is your ideal client first and then tell, tell me how people reach you. 
Uh, ideal client is somebody who knows what they want to do and are a nice, respectful person. Uh, this is a business where you can certainly rip your hair out at times just in anything, but where, where people will can run you a little ragged, waste your time, waste their time, waste other people's times, not knowing what they want, you know, not telling, not being honest with you. And so I work with, you know, first time home buyers that are getting a loan and want to start a family all the way up to fortune 500 CEOs that want to buy their fifth house. And so it's, it's everything in between, but the consistent part of that is, you know, if, if they're good people, they respect me and they know I'm working hard for them. That's, that's all I can ask for. Um, and then with regard to contacting me, I am, you know, we've got three offices with Silverleaf Realty, uh, here in Scottsdale, Old Town Scottsdale and Flagstaff. So we represent anybody anywhere. You can reach me on our website, silverleafrealty.com. And, and you can reach me, um, my phone. It's 602-399-3507. Awesome. Yep. Again, appreciate you coming in. And it's a timely topic. Uh, I am with you in the sense I'm extremely bullish yep. for Arizona for the future here. I'm very happy coming from New York City that this is where now 16 years ago I chose to, to build my life and my business. And uh, and anybody that's that, that wants to get, get involved in this party, come on in, but just don't kill the golden goose, man. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you come here, just remember, nope. remember, remember why you moved here. Remember why you moved here. Yeah. But hey, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day. I know yep. you're a busy man. And, I, uh, I appreciate you having me. This is great. Excellent. Yep. Guys, this has been fantastic. Brent, I don't know if I ever told you, but my wife and I met in Phoenix and I love it. I didn't know that really. Yeah. 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 She was, she was going to tech school and I went on vacation and then I just stayed once I met her. So that was it. I was you were there on vacation. Yeah. Met, yeah. met, met your wife. And, yeah. and hung around long enough to make this stick. Yeah, my, my buddy was going to the same tech school for a totally different thing. I went down to visit him, and when I met her, I was like, that's it. I'm done. I'm staying here, and, and uh, the rest is history. But, yeah, we loved it. We loved Phoenix. It was so much stuff to do, but that was, shoot, almost 30 years ago. So yeah. Smart I know man. it's grown since then. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, the difference in this valley from when I arrived here in 07 to now, um, it's staggering. But it is really – it's a, it's a world-class destination to come as a visitor and it's phenomenal yeah. to live here. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, this is a great podcast. Thank you both for all the information. Uh, Brent, of course, thank you so much for, for hosting this. And our last thank you goes to the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Smart Money Simplified podcast with Brent Mikosh. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Brent comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. And we humbly ask that you share this podcast, rate it, and leave a review as this actually does help others find the show. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at MP Advisors, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Smart Money Simplified Podcast. Have any questions about topics covered during the show? Visit www.smartmoneysimplified.com or give us a call at 602-255-0555. Don't forget to click the follow button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the hosts and or guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your individual situation. Securities are offered through Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated, member FINRA, and SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors Incorporated, MP Advisors, LLC, is not a broker slash dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services.